All right, good morning, everybody. We've, I know you've been practicing this now for two days, so we're going we're gonna to hopefully get it on the first try. Jain Dobre. Ah, it's not bad. They're getting better, aren't they? These guys are going to come away with this, uh, this week. You're going to have something in your back pocket. You're going to know how to say one word in Polish. Um, so here's the thing. Today we're going to do a little summation, and then we're going to have two little extra special grand finale mini tiny presentations at the very end. We have total one hour to sort of sum up and encapsulate everything that we've taken away. And I wanted to start by saying that some of this is going to sound like critique. But it's just healthy debate, it's healthy discussion. And the thing is, when you're going to critique someone, they say that you should always walk a mile in their shoes. And the reason that you should walk a mile in their shoes is because at that point you're a mile away and you're in their shoes and they can't follow you. So, I mean, there's a, there's a good reason that, that this expression has been surviving so long over history, but I want you to just keep in mind that we're not critiquing so much as just discussing. So what I want to do is I want to start out by kind of throwing a few questions to the panel that we were here yesterday, and we have an, a new addition. We have professors here. We have our local representative. Now, you sat so patiently and quietly. You've been sucking everything in from the conference, all this stuff people have been saying. And I know your mind is very active. You've been digesting. And I have a, one or two questions for you, but let me start with this. We had a little bit of discussion about this during the coffee break. Now, it's a bit of a club to get into to become a heritage site. There's 1,092. There's been a bit of inflation. It's not quite the elitist club it was. It, you know, maybe in the 70s they were talking about 100 UNESCO sites. Now it's gotten a little higher. Do we have sound here? What do you think about this? Is this a good thing? Should they have kept the number small? Is it good that it's growing? Your thoughts? It is really the essential question touching also the question of the convention. So initially, convention invented by the experts could be also seen as a kind of a beauty contest just roughly for 100, the best of the best. So to tell you the truth, personally, I was uh, for pretty long time pretty sure that the inflation, the growing number of inscriptions is very much against the initial spirit. But now I'm converted. What made you can get converted? I'm converted also uh, after chairing this session in Krakow two years ago and realizing that at the moment, those over 1,000 inscriptions means 165 state parties, simply countries where we have cities and places inscribed at the World Heritage List, which means that it is not just a matter of a beauty contest, it is just not a matter of uh, Taj Mahal and the pyramids, but it is just the essential message sent by the international community to everyone that it is our common heritage and we should promote a certain standards, a, cent a certain approach okay. to the local communities. But are you worried that this is too much like pouring kind of promotional petrol on these places, bringing so much attention to them and many of them can't handle it? Are you worried that it's, it is a problem that way? It, it is now the main problem of the list and those who are happy to be inscribed. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at the evolution of the list, one could simply say that the idea invented by a small group of experts, negotiated by politicians and diplomats, <laughs> implemented by bureaucrats, <laughs> uh, exploded by tour operators and hoteliers, finally landed as the responsibilities of local communities. And it is the essence of our meeting here. It sounds like a vicious cocktail. It's become yes. over tourism or unbalanced. Yes, but I'm tourism. happy that yeah. in Krakow, especially yesterday, it was quite clear that the point is on the side of, in this very game at the moment, yeah. is on the side of local communities. Cool. I agree. Did, do you have another, any, one more favorite insight from yesterday that you really feel like stuck with you? As no. a, in German, one could say Schadenfreude, which means that it is not just our Krakowian problem with over-tourism, or as you like, yeah. uh, unbalanced tourism. Unbalanced tourism. Yeah. We are learning. Yeah. Uh, 
but uh, of course it is at the moment a global problem which of course requires such meetings like this we should simply share our uh, experience mm. and I'm very much uh, impressed concerning the presentation by the mayor of Dubrovnik mm. it is really something which is uh, added value of this very meeting in Krakow. There's a lot of action going on there. They're taking actual steps. No doubt, to, and yeah. the understanding of, on the side of politicians, that it is simply a very difficult game, and mm. the responsibilities and the price for those responsibilities on the side of politicians. Now I know that as professor, you are used to a 90-minute class. We're going to make three sure minutes. We it is much more <laughs> difficult. <laughs> We're going to anyway, try to go down the list here. If I pass the exam. You I'm did, silent <laughs> up to the end. <laughs> you did brilliantly. And, and few, we'll be, have a chance to all chime in a bit later. Let's jump on to our keynote here, urbanization. Now, a lot of people were, were listening intently. It's a brilliant theme. And it's hard to kind of condense this. And I was watching the presentation, and I was trying to kind of boil it down. If you were to say one thing that people in this room can go home and start thinking or doing differently, or what they can, what's the first thing that they should apply when they get home? that they're not doing today? Okay, <clears throat> I'm going to disobey you because I'm going to just mention three things. <laughs> but in the, in the time I will need just to mention You're one. not even a politician. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, it's urbanization, not urbanization, oh, urbanization. So the first point has to do with uh, uh, admitting that all of us, we are tourists. So this is as a transversal condition we need to understand. So we need to take much more advantage of tourists. That we're all so, tourists. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sooner or later we are going to be a tourist. We have been tourists in the past. We share that condition as well. Okay. So we cannot think about uh, two different worlds, black and white. First point. Second point, we need to finally understand how tourism is working today. Yesterday I said that we are still use the same word tourism for something that has nothing to do compared with how tourism used to be before. One single right. example. Let's imagine one Chinese tourist, he would leave China to Venice. Let's think about uh, one Venetian mask, mass produced in China. Hmm. The mask would do the same travel. Both of them, they would meet in Venice and then they would come back together. <laughs> this is global tourism today. Right. We need to understand the nature, the changing nature of that. And then the third point. Now they're building a Venice in China so they can buy the mask <laughs> right there. They don't have to leave home. <laughs> Maybe. So the final point has to do uh, with uh, uh, the idea of urbanization, and this is answering finally your question. So okay. I, I was a bit tricky with you, sorry. So uh, in this world we're living in, we need to understand the potential of tourism for the understanding of places. Uh, let me give you one example. I work in Venice as a visitor professor, so I spent half of the year in there. We were invited to visit uh, as professors, uh, there's 12 people, only 12 people, uh. the San Marco Basilica by night without electricity. And then we understood with the light of the candles why the cupolas are golden and why in the old times they spent all so much time and effort to produce that really tiny little pieces of gold materials on the top because this atmosphere, once your eyes there get used to the dark with the candles, this invites you to introspection, to reflection, so you feel nice. It's really a completely experience, magnificent experience. No single tourist visiting Venice can enjoy this. Ah. Because, not only because they are too much over tourism, yeah. but because the management of tourism is changing. So during the day, they don't use candles, they use electricity, but they just turn the focus, the light on the golden pieces so the tourists, they can take a picture from the outside. Two different experiences. Yeah, like, I let you choose which is the one it's a, you would It's prefer. an excellent answer, but it really gets also the core of what we're going to get, the core of what we're going to get to at the end of the, the row here with the unbalanced slash over tourism, where there is a finite amount of people that can experience something amazing like that. And so what do you allow to dictate how many visitors you have? Do you allow it to be the smallest uh, bottleneck or do you allow it to be the largest thing the, the capacity. Your question is, is, is crucial because it has to do with the concept of authenticity. Yes. We were talking about that before. Again, tourism today works with different parameters. Today, tourists 
Some of them, they can enjoy authentic experiences in authentic places, but some of them, they can experience in authentic experiences in authentic places mm. and authentic experiences in inauthentic places. Yeah. We need to understand that this is happening. It's a strange thing. I remember being in Bangkok in a completely touristed area. I took one step to a bus stop, one more step onto a local bus, and suddenly I went from only tourists to on a local bus with no air conditioning with only locals. It's not an experience you would necessarily want, but it was extremely authentic. And that's part of the thing is a lot of the authentic experiences available today don't have the glamour, but they're still there, but we're not, it's, a, yeah, it's so tricky. It's five seconds. In any case, I think that tourists, because we are, we love, all of us, we are tourists, we should have the right to choose. Yeah. Let's have, continue right down the alley, if you can pass the microphone on. We are talking about communicating heritage. And in, if I was going to say this, of all your, you had a number of examples, and some from Liverpool. I was going to think, if you think globally for a second, what have you seen during your travels, or even, even in Liverpool, that you think is the, the best example of how communicating heritage really, really works? How it permeates across the ages, across uh, ethnicities, and really connects people to place. If you have one thing that really stands out. I think that um, the involvement of the public, which has reassuringly been a key issue for most of the presenters here, mm. you know, means that, that we, have, we are trying to democratize her heritage. It is being, it's gone out of the hands of the professional elite, and it's, but it brings dangers with it in going into the hands of the public How so? and politicians. Well, it brings risks because um, they're not necessarily trained the way that, that we are to, to think. Somebody has to take the responsibility for looking after the heritage. It's not often, it's not always the public and it's not always the politicians. That's the true. politicians are more interested in... in um, Tourists but is, bring, does it have to work a little cash. bit like McDonald's that way? Does it have to kind of be able to work in a mass market way for it to be effective? I don't think, I don't think so, um, except if I'm the person responsible for income coming into a place because there are no jobs doing anything else, for example, like a place like Liverpool, right. w which was its whole reason for being is now finished. It's a post-industrial city. Right. So British Empire is finished. British um, industrial primacy is finished. So the reasons for Liverpool's greatness are finished. Therefore, unemployment can be very high. So one of the futures that we're looking for in Liverpool is tourism. And every, every badge of honor that we get in Liverpool helps drive tourists to the place, but there are risks and dangers. So there is currently there's, um, many people in the audience will be aware that Liverpool are the new football champions of Europe and I, as I've a result of this there's a lot of social media interest in this it includes a young Liverpool guy who, who who was partially responsible for changing the name in Madrid of a place called Thatcher Square now Margaret Thatcher is a very very unpopular with many people in Britain popular with some very unpopular with others she's very unpopular with me mm. if, I, if I if I have to so what the Liverpool fans did when they were in Madrid is that they, they draped a banner over the Thatcher sign, saying, so renaming it Corbyn Square. Corbyn is equally a figure of um, dissension, but he's the great socialist leader right. in Britain at the moment. Now, the point is that the, the, Liverpoolian, the young Liverpoolian guy said Liverpool has always been a Labour, a socialist city, which is untrue. But that's what he thinks. It's up to people like me to correct him because that's what he thinks. There's nothing wrong with what he thinks, but, he's, but he is wrong about that. He's factually incorrect. And I think that the more we involve the public in heritage issues, the more we run the risk of the lack of right. authenticity, for when, example. When I hear about, when I think about communication and tourism and the connection there, what I think of is something that you just described a little bit earlier, which is a city needs to reinvent itself. You talked about Liverpool coming out of this post-industrial period and sort of saying, who are we now? If we're no longer an industrial city, who are we? And a lot of these cities are trying to figure out how to reinvent themselves like Madonna and say, oh, like in Salem, uh, Massachusetts, they, oh, we, were, we, we hung our hats on this whole witch thing for a long time. Or in Hawaii, they said we had a, a luau, but we're getting a little tired of that. How do we move on to the next thing? And this, has been, this is, continues to be the great communication debate going on in almost every destination. For if we're not the thing that we have our heritage, 
and we want to evolve and be a modern city, how can we be both? How do we have this dichotomy going on? Do you, do you see that playing out everywhere? Well, I've seen it play out particularly in Liverpool, where, where, which has been known to many people as the city of the Beatles. You right. know, well, but the Beatles have been finished for more than 50 years now. It's a long, they're a long time ago. People are too young to remember them. They're rediscovering the music, maybe. The music may be timeless, it may not be. Right. But the point is that um, Liverpool can no longer expect to live off the back of the Beatles. It has, to, it has to move on. And it's an interesting question, what does it move on to? But tourism is, 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 will always be there, providing that the, the built heritage reflects the greatness of when Liverpool was a place right. that was very different from what it is now. That's the, that, I, that, I think, is the point. Doesn't it call to mind Butler's graph, the famous 1980 graph of the professor, who, and it goes like a bit of a bell curve, and it starts to come down, like tourism gets up, it gets popular, and is it just before it comes down, if it reinvents itself, it can have another life. And it kind of, so like in India, they go, okay, now we're an Ayurvedic destination. And then they might say, and just as that starts to go down, they can say, oh, now we're a kite surf destination. I mean, kind of looking to catch that next wave all the time after five or 10 or 15, 20 years. I think this is, this is one of the interesting aspects of the authentic, the authentic heritage because when, once you are a great heritage place, you should always be, providing you look after it carefully. Mm. But unlike, for example, British seaside towns, places like Blackpool used to, used to be very popular with tourists. Who cares anymore? The weather's not good, the facilities are decaying, there's not the money there. So they've, they, they've now plateaued, they've moved well on, but they didn't really have... The, 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 the fixed heritage, they didn't have the backstory, I, I don't think. Okay. We're going to move on down and hit the over to it. Well, let's go with that word for a second. And, and, and the first quote that comes to mind is a famous one by Paul Thoreau, that as soon as a place gets a reputation for being paradise, it goes straight to hell. And, and if, we, if we use this, that over-tourism is here, and then we say, therefore, there must be then tourism, and there must be under-tourism. So a lot of places have felt that they've had under-tourism, that they want more, and they can't quite be happy when they get to tourism. They never quite can sit back and go, I guess we've achieved what we're after. This must be the magic spot. Let's just stay here for a while. And they just kind of keep wanting more. And then suddenly they hit over tourism, if we want to use that analogy, or unbalanced. Who's doing it? Who's, who's saying, OK, we can't, as a city here, I'm going to say this is probably across the board, there's no city in the world that can handle 100 million visitors a day, or even in a year. So then the question is, how many can you handle? What's the magic number? And what defines that number? Is it the bottleneck? Is it the airport? Like, who's doing something about this and doing it well? Um, that's a blooming difficult question. Um, because I also don't know of places that do everything well. I know cities that, are, that do parts of it very good. I mean, we saw Dubrovnik. It's very interesting what's going on there. and really good. I know that Bruges, um, as for as the amount of visitors it gets, uh, and the small well, smallness of the site, it's amazing. They are doing amazingly well. Uh, they just get so many people that it even there again becomes an issue. And I think the key problem here is at the moment that uh, this growth paradigm, like we need growth, we need growth, we need growth. And what we're missing is this vision of like, yeah, maybe, maybe we need to not have continuous growth and just have probably popular term, quality over quantity, define both. Um, but I think that's where we need to go, the vision, like who, let's work together with other people. Speaking to some people today, and um, how many people working at a heritage site, uh, or heritage managers, have a background in, for example, tourism? Very few. They're basically architects, restaurateurs, blah, blah, blah. How many people in tourism know heritage? Very few. How many people in policy know both? Very few. So it becomes a bit difficult then to create a united vision of saying, like, yeah, this is enough. And then the underlying thing that everybody still hears is, like, we need growth, growth, growth. So that's where it goes to. If you ask me, like, give, a, give an example of places where things are going well, then I would say the places that are doing well are the places that dare to take a risk. Um, we need to do unpopular things, and we may need to do degrowth. Uh, I think Dubrovnik said it very clearly. We are taking a risk here. This might lead to the mayor not being re-elected. In Bruges, same thing. The mayor took a lot of unpopular decisions, 
or seemingly unpopular decisions that he felt were necessary for the city. He was not re-elected. Um, so there are things there that are going well, but we need that. So, but the, maybe it's like a mindset. So like if someone builds a brand new, beautiful golf course, they still know it's four people starting every 15 minutes, and that's, they, they've built it knowing there's going to be a finite amount of people per day they can push through. If you build a new movie theater, there's only so many seats. You've built a capitalist venture, but you know there's a ceiling to it. Don't we, as a destination, as a city, need to just get into the, our heads? There's a level. In, I mean, we could take in 100 million at a brand new airport, but we ha it, they'd clog up the streets. We'd chase away the locals. Yep. But there's like the, that we've got to somehow figure out some way to start measuring it. No one's ever going to agree on it. Yep. But put down something and we, try to start aiming towards that. Is that abs absolutely agree. We need indicators that basically highlight more about like what are levels of acceptable change in, this, in places. The problem is cities are open systems, have always been. So there's a lot of sentiment saying, oh, no, no, we can't lock up cities. Uh, and in a lot of places, it's physically impossible to lock them up, like gates, et cetera. Yeah, it won't work. So we need to think about alternative ways of, well, first of all, measuring what we see as acceptable. And that will require a lot of discussion. I mean, I know uh, these discussions in Amsterdam have been taking place for over five years now, and it's still ongoing. It's just very difficult. Um, but there are possibilities. I mean, if we're talking about smartness all of the time. And at the moment, what I see in cities when we mention smart, um, it's apps. We build an app for, for 20 thousand different, different things. And what do we do with them? What do we use them for? We should start also looking at like the possibilities of these new technologies to think further and think creatively. Uh, like we were talking about it yesterday. Um, linking up all destinations in a city and um, public transport providers and, and hotels, etc., in one card, band, whatever we have by that time, um, to get insights into where people are traveling and how. I know within Europe, legislatory, that's very difficult. Privacy laws are luckily very good here. But there are possibilities. And I think cities need to take chances here and risk. Because if cities don't do it, I can guarantee you within 10 or 15 years, Google, Facebook, Apple, Lord knows who's the next one, will do this kind of thing. And they'll do it in a way, like Airbnb has done, create an incredibly good product that runs ahead of the legislatory frameworks, and then you're paying catch up. And then you create a service that is so good for both visitors and probably also residents, because it's nicely monitored. But then all that data and all that knowledge goes to an individual company. Is that what we want? So it's kind of like creating a utility. It's almost like letting Google or Airbnb come in and put up your electricity grid or your water grid and having all the data and all the control of that. And we're saying, hey, maybe we as a city should put in our own tourism digital infrastructure, own it, own the data, get out ahead of it, and not just wait for some giant company to come in and kind of own us and then have to fight them in court all the time to get our own data and our own control. That's basically yeah. what... Yep. That's what you're saying. And then, but the other thing is, how do you fight the bottom feeders? When you have tour buses and you have cruise ships, there's always someone selling these cheap refrigerator magnets and schlocky T-shirts, and they're making money off of it. And the city as a whole could probably make a lot more money if it went a little bit higher scale. It got rid of that kind of stuff, put that to the side, and focused on the higher spending overnight guests wanting a nicer experience. But these guys are going to put up a fight. How do you fight the refrigerator magnet sellers? Well, the refrigerator magnet sellers also have a place in the city. It's, it's a balance, finding the balance between how many of them are there and the higher paying tourists. If you have a city with only, might not be the most popular thing to say here, cultural tourists, they're boring. You want diversity in your, the people living there and the people visiting. It's diversity. That makes, I think, cities nice. Mm. Um, so there's a room for the magnet sellers, but you need a legislatory framework within the city that... Yeah. says no, and that is enforced, and regulation is enforced. Same with the cruise ships. Yeah. Talk to other things. We have the, pro the city is the product. Yeah. That's the position of power, I'd say. By the way, I'm going to say that we're not going to be able to cover all aspects of this. I do have some ideas of how to address all this in a poor city. We don't have the time to do it today. Come find me afterward if we're going to do this. I want you to pass the microphone back to David for a second, because we just talked about, about communicating something. Uh, and. I've gone to a number of tourism conferences where I've said that they've said museums are dying. We need to bring them back to life. And there have been some interesting ideas where they've actually bringing in almost like comedians 
who were doing funny tours, fast-paced tours of museums, doing them at night by candlelight, like you're suggesting, an unusual kind of tour. Is there ways that you've seen from the museum side to the same kind of techniques that they've used to bring back that communication and connect people with the museum to enliven it that they could do with an entire city or a heritage site? I think, well, I, I, I would disagree that museums are dying. Museums are not the same yeah. as they used to be, that's, yeah. that, that's for sure. But I, don't, I not, meant that they're just they're losing visitors in, in a lot of places. Because, because they, they refuse to abide by the old definitions, and that is probably, uh, there's probably a lesson there. Just to say, I just want to say that in a number of museums, they've been going down in attendance. That's what I meant by dying. And, and not well, all museums, well, but they, just... They're growing hugely in some places if, if, sure. if, if they're becoming more relevant to modern society, for example. Good point. I, 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 I paraphrase. But my, my colleague used a very interesting word there, which is the word power. Power and politics. Who's in control of World Heritage Sites? The heritage professionals used to think it was them, but it is no longer. If, it ever was, if that was ever true, it's not true anymore. Okay. The power is in the hand of the politicians. The politicians are representatives of the people who live there. This is what we've got to remember. I'm, not, I'm absolutely not against this. I'm, I'm not arguing against it. Yeah. I merely observe that this is, this is okay. what I think is happening. Okay. Um, so who is making these decisions about, about cities? And um, where, where do the politicians want them to go? Well, the politicians, generally speaking, need to be elected or selected, reselected, re-elected. And okay. they have a constituency out there. Um, they need to communicate with the constituency. The media, I think, are important in this because, for example, I think some of the debates about heritage, whether it's Dubrovnik or Liverpool or anywhere else, is, is very low caliber. Okay. The, the discussions are not, not good enough. And it's, it's, it's kind of the responsibility of all of us who are interested in looking after the heritage and, and making sure that it matches up with what politicians want to do, which is to create wealth in places. I think this, this, this is the big challenge for heritage professionals nowadays, okay. is to acknowledge that we're no longer in control, and it's to help and advise people who are responsible okay. for making sure that a place has Good. a future. Good and point. future is a word that has kept coming up, particularly in the presentations, I have to say, this morning. Yeah. So although there was a lot of yeah. great news, you know, my city is a wonderful city. Well, we, we, we could all argue that. Doesn't Nonetheless, the word the future was used right. a lot by a lot of the... Let me, let me do this. If you could pass this down. The professor has written an entire book while we've been sitting here. I know you've got ideas going in your head. Did you have a question you wanted to ask or a point you wanted to make? Because I see you've just been taking notes ferociously during the last uh, 10 minutes here. See, I'm taking notes because I'm obliged finally to summarize the whole session. <laughs> but Great. nevertheless, uh, I think that what's coming out from our discussions is that we shall simply go further on. It is not just a matter of so-called management plan, right. uh, which is simply a part of, of, of UNESCO system. We shall start to think about management systems. And if so, those management systems, it should be the responsibility of the mayors, municipalities, right. and local communities, and it is at the conclusion. Right. I think in Peter De Bruyne with the UNESCO toolkit, I haven't looked into that myself, but that sound, seems like it's some of those kind of mechanisms for management. Before we go any further, we want to throw this out to the audience. We just have something. If you could get on your phones, if we could make this active on my screen here, whatever's on my laptop out here. Could you go on to slido.com, throw in that number, and it's going to allow you to vote. I thought we'd just do a few little things. So slido.com, 9499. If everyone can then vote with your phones, and we'll get some interesting answers to some questions here. You guys, the panel can do it as well, if you don't mind taking out your phones if you brought them with you up on stage. Does everyone have that? Slido.com. I'm going to go out of this. You're going to be able to see how this thing works, hopefully. I'm showing you behind the scenes. Let's go to this first question right here. I'm going to act. Slido.com, 9499. 9499. So here's the question. What metric have you been using in your city for the last five years to measure tourism? Number of visitors, overnights, revenue or profit? Again, slido.com, 9499. First question. Okay, interesting. It's, the results are coming in with 19 participants. You guys can see it on the screen here? Interesting. Here we go. 
the voting is coming in. It's interesting that overnights is becoming such a big part because so many are cruise ship and tour visitors as well. But this has been popular. I don't want to influence the decision while it's coming in. Is this what you expected? Anything, any surprises from the panel or is this what you saw coming? Francis, is this about what you... See, the traditional indicators we normally use. This is the traditional indicators we normally use. Right. So, I mean, we, we need to innovate a lot. Uh, okay, now I'm going to make a pitch and then I'm going to ask you another question again. So one of the things that's happening as well is that if we sort of think of this like a business, if you had the same amount of visitors and you could, if you wanted, make more money with one group, would you want, or let's just say this, if you, had, if you could have a few less visitors but make a lot more money, would that be more interesting as a city? to make more money. So in which case, if you say yes, that means you're in it for the money. You're in tourism, not because you like tourists so much, but you're in it because you like the revenue from it or the, the profits from it. And if we also factor in that tourists, you know, they have costs. You have to clean up the street. We have electricity. We have water. There's leakages. 25% goes right to the Netherlands in booking.com. 15, 16, 17% goes directly to Hilton or whatever other health, uh, hotel corporate headquarters. Never enters your local destination. So if we're not thinking like a business and looking at profit, we're not doing a very good job at running this like a business. So then the next question is, having just made that pitch, let me ask the question again. Here's the next question, if you could vote. What metric should you be using more in the future? I kind of rigged the election a little bit, but I mean, do you think there's a smarter metric that we should be using? Should we still be looking at visitors? What should we be doing? Because I think this is something that seems to be changing in the tourism world as I go out there. It's a pretty interesting change. You guys see this on the panel here. Cole, what do you think of this? Does this seem like it's... It seems like we have... You can use the microphone, it's working. Is it? Um, it seems like a, a step towards a more uh, interesting metric um i mean yeah th there's a slight worry like what's revenue uh when there's still a lot of leakages but fair enough uh there is of course this still are all um the two bottom ones are still economic indicators so you might want to find another indicator that is a little bit more all encompassing even um but i find it interesting to see that uh, a one minute pitch can change people's perceptions if yeah. they were not already changed for the future before so if we go here we see here we had um, up to 43% saying revenue. Let's go to the next one. Here's the next question here. Let's activate this poll right here. We talked a bit before. Some people were showing in the island of Vispi and other places these little signs showing you to wear proper clothing, not to eat ice cream out on the main square, and other things that help the tourists be better behaved tourists. What's the best way to do that? Should we just be putting up these signs? Is that enough? Should we have like in-flight videos and tell the, tell the, we ask the guides to please tell their tour gr groups to please do this? Should we have penalties? Where we actually, when they step off the cruise ship, maybe you have someone from the city there that says, I'm sorry, you're so welcome in our city, but you're not gonna be able to come in wearing that bikini. Please put something else on and then you're very welcome to come in our city. Or we'll be fining you 25 euros or whatever. Because I see a lot of the signs, I see some education out there, and I see very few penalties for people doing these things. It's starting to happen a little bit more and more, but it's interesting to see this survey. Very interesting, look at this. Professor, what do you think? Is that what you expected? Education, no doubt. Education. I just want to throw this stuff out there. And now what I want to do is just sort of get you guys involved to see what you are thinking, each other is thinking about these things. Let's do this. We can, we can turn off the screen now. Hello? Can we turn off this? We can turn off this screen. I wanted to just throw out to some questions that give you guys a chance to kind of ask questions to the panel, to me, any of your observations of what you've tried and any of the things we've talked about, whether it's compliance, limiting visitors in some way, I mean, there are places doing it. The island of, you know, Fernando de Naruña off the coast of Brazil allows 460 visitors per day. The wave, this is a beautiful red rock formation in Utah, allows 20 people per day. Seeing the gorillas, there's a limit. 
going to the Harry Potter studio tour. There's a limit. A lot of individual places are doing limits, but as a city, what are you, is anyone doing anything interesting? We have some microphones, I think, are out roving. Who, where are microphones? Right here and here. Put your hand up if you have something. Anyone have a comment or a question? They want to make some observation of someone they've seen doing it well somewhere. Anybody? Has anyone seen any examples of carrying capacity? Let me ask you this. Let's do this. Does, any, does anyone have their hand up? I can't see any hands. Here we have one right here. Okay, I'm, I'm from Granada. I'm Gracia. Granada, in, yeah. Yes. In 1986, the Alhambra, uh, thinking about the over tourism, and start with uh, their capacity. It was 10,500 every day. Now it's 8,500. Okay. And the why thing, did you go down? Why did you go down those 2,000? Because it was too much. Okay. So you're <laughs> too just, many people. Yeah, too you're many tweaking it as it goes. Yes. Okay. So the thing is, all the industry says that's awful. No, no many people will come again to Granada. And the, the results are completely the same. It, it, completely uh, the other side. Opposite. Opposite. One, one second. How many did you have before you limited it to 10,000? Yes, two million five hundred. Wait, wait. You went every year. Okay, down visitors. to how down to how many per year? Uh, Just so we're comparing. Two million, two million five hundred. Uh, two million uh, five hundred per year. Tourists per year. In 1986. Okay, and then you went down to. Yes, and now we have three millions. Uh, after that, but the industry is growing. Uh, because we had only 5,000 beds in, 19, in 1986, and now we have 20,000 beds plus Airbnb. <laughs> what okay. we don't well, really one second. Know. You lost me though. So you said in Alhambra, yes. you went down. Yes. And you went down, you started at 10,000, and you went we down have to 8,000. The same, the same figures. But at what the did end you have before? Year. What did you have in there before you made it 10,000? What was it? before that, per, and you're saying per day? Per Ten, day. How many 10, was it per, per day. day before it was 10,000? Uh, we didn't know. You didn't know, okay. We, we, so we you, just uh, sell, sell okay. tickets, uh, all, the, all the people who come to, uh, okay, to the so door. Okay, so you put in 10,000, you yes. decided that didn't work, you tweaked it down to 8,000 something. Okay. That's right. And so, everyone thought it was gonna go down, yes. but instead? But yes, but the industry is growing up. Uh -huh. Despite that. Yes, and the thing is, uh, we have, to, uh, we have uh, Tourism the, the whole uh, year, and before we just have tourism for six years, six right. months, sorry. Right. Okay? Yep. So the thing is that we can provide uh, some tools to, to regulate this because at the end it's good for the industry. They don't like at, at the beginning, you know, it was so difficult to, to get these it was unpopular. measures. But yes. so what you're saying as well is that. What, what happened, if I'm just going to diagram this yeah. out, if we're looking at a giant bell curve, uh -huh. right? And this is the peak season in the summer when all the tourists mm -hmm. come. If you make it unlimited capacity, everyone goes in the summer, it becomes a very steep curve. Yes. But if you cap it, it actually pushes it down, makes it more exclusive, yes. and you get people more year round because they can't book then. So they book on the shoulder season, then the off season, and that you find you have a total, as I understand correctly, more capacity at this lower level year round than having this kind of crazy graph. Is that, yes, is that that's what happened to us. Yes, wow. that's right. Interesting. That's a yes. great case study right yes. there. Does anyone here think that that might work where they live? If someone put a cap on something, that you initially would be scared and your stakeholders would push back, but that it could work. Does anyone feel like that could actually work? But are you're, or you're thinking that could be something to bring home and suggest? Or does it still seem to, does anyone think that sounds too scary? Any, it sounds like a good idea. Does that give you some confidence to try it when you hear this story? I, I... Go ahead. You can wrap. Hello. Yeah, ah. I think it's a very good idea to uh, to, to to make uh, a limit, and I I think it should work. I could bring it to my city. I'm from Rooch, so I think uh, this works very well. You don't have to be scared. The stakeholders are always against. I think in my city, for example, um, 
a, w a week or two ago only, the Hotel uh, League phoned to the cabinet of the, the mayor and they said, w they said, we have to talk to you immediately. It's very, very urgent. And they, they came. He said, oh my God, what's happening? And they came and they said to him, we don't have 100% um, capacity. capacity. What are you going to do about this? We have only 85% of uh, allez, capacity, bookings. Yeah, yeah. What are you going to do about this? <laughs> so it's completely crazy, okay. in my opinion. This became the new normal was 100% in that yes, season. Yes, the new normal is 100%. We do have 8.3 million visitors a year. They want 10 million. We don't want it. So yeah. I think limits are good. Let me ask you this. Does anybody know? I'm not asking. Oh, go ahead. Yes, we can bring the microphone right here. All the way to Mexico, correct? Yes. Right behind you. Me the Mexico behind you. Lilia Martinez de Puebla, México. Okay. Tenemos nosotros un, eh, una procesión en Semana Santa. Este año recibimos 17 mil personas y la procesión dura exactamente dos horas. Eso llegó a complicar tanto el manejo del centro histórico que desde el año pasado, previendo que podemos encontrar una mejor solución. Un segundo, un segundo, un momentito. Um, so 17,000, just to kind of quick translate, about 17,000 visitors in just coming for a day visit for two hours. Do I understand correctly? No me dieron Más la traducción. Hace 10,000 personas en dos horas. Sí. 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 Okay, I understood correctly. 17,000. So 17,000 yeah, 17, people just in two hours for a quick visit. Yes, continue. 17,000. Continue, por favor. Eh, lo que se hizo el año, ya desde el año pasado es hacer una procesión. El día jueves santo y ya llegaron 4,000 personas. Quiere decir que se está equilibrando con otra procesión para no tener tanta gente el viernes santo. Y a partir de este año se hace una okay, tercera I'm procesión de 2,000 personas Thanks. en Jueves de Corpus. Se llama eh, Turismo Religioso en Puebla y eso ha mejorado el, el, el manejo del Centro Histórico okay. Patrimonio que tenemos 391 manzanas, pero era ya imposible tener solo en dos horas 17 mil personas. Entonces ya se hicieron una, un via crucis y una segunda procesión. Okay. I'm going to have to cut you off right, right there because I'm, my Spanish has just run out. And I, gonna, I could easily throw to our resident from Barcelona, but you did reduce, you said to 4,000. Did I get that correctly? Do you want to answer, do a quick syn synopsis? I think that the most interesting thing about the example yeah. is just that uh, the nature of tourism, of over tourism, forces the local uh, uh, local government to double the offer. So you, ha you have an additional uh, uh, parade, profession, uh, because in this way you can have just better distributed the tourists, which is a very interesting example mm -hmm. for understanding See. of See. this relationship between tourism and management. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, because the, let's say, authentic thing would be just having just one parade Yes, I'm bringing a point. So uh, we need to understand these uh, relationships and how management is important. By the way, let me just take advantage of a microphone. Uh, I would have really appreciated in the second question having one additional answer saying which part of the profit and revenue is going to local communities. Right. Because it would be a very interesting indicator for the future. Let me stop you right there. This is a great question. Thank you for that and thanks for making the comment on this.